expect others are going to come in, but we're not going to wait for them. Since you were prompt, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Bob Hathaway. I've got the good fortune to run the Asia program here at the Wilson Center. Um, as probably many of you know, maybe most of you, the Wilson Center is the nation's official memorial to our 28th president. Um, we seek to commemorate uh, President Wilson's um, scholarly depth and his policy, public policy concerns, uh, or to say it another way, uh, to serve as something of a bridge between the world of the policymaker and the world of the scholar. Um, and indeed, uh, I am flanked by one person from each of those worlds uh, today. Uh, North Korea is our topic. Uh, virtually every day brings a new worrisome development from the Korean Peninsula. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, saw the latest report this morning um, suggesting that Pyongyang was uh, considering or threatening to permanently close the Kaesan Industrial uh, Complex, uh, which has been one of its few remaining links to the north. Uh, many analysts uh, suggest that um, things are drifting in a dangerous direction. We'll examine that proposition uh, shortly. Uh, many people, of course, are saying that what we really need uh, in dealing with North Korea and thinking about North Korea uh, is smart power. Well, amazingly enough, that's exactly what we're looking at today. Uh, smart power for North Korea, U.S. policy options, and North Korea's foreign policy priorities. We'll be hearing first from Dr. Hazel Smith. Um, Hazel is a visiting scholar here at the Wilson Center. Uh, we're delighted to have her and uh, to give her an opportunity to share some of her expertise uh, with Sorry about that, uh, with a wi wider audience today. Uh, when Hazel is not at the Wilson Center, she is a professor of security and resilience at Cranfield University in the UK. Um, unlike myself, certainly, and I think some other people who profess to know something about North Korea, Hazel has actually lived there uh, for several years um, when she was working for the World Food Program and for UNICEF. Um, after hearing from Hazel, we'll then turn to Ambassador Joseph Detrani. Uh, incidentally, you've got their bios in front of you, so I'm simply giving you the very abbreviated uh, version. Uh, Joe Detrani is president of the Intelligence and National Security Alliance here in Washington. Um, he's had an extraordinarily distinguished career in the U.S. government, primarily in uh, diplomatic and intelligence positions. Um, among the positions he held were his special envoy for six-party negotiations with the North Koreans um, and the U.S. representative to KEDO, the Korea Energy Development Organization. Uh, we want to leave uh, plenty of time for you to ask questions of our two panelists. So without further ado, Hazel, we turn things over to you. Thank you, Bob. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming on what is a glorious day, perhaps the first day of summer. Is it, can you hear? Is this on? Is it on? Can you hear me now? OK. Uh, okay. Thanks, Bob, and thanks to everybody for coming today. Uh, before I start, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center for its incredibly kind hospitality over the past nearly nine months. Bob, James, the person who's in the audience here, uh, Shihoko, as Josh, all the people who've made things just absolutely fantastic. For those of you that work either in the ac ac academic or the policy field, you know that it's a real privilege to be able to have nine months to be able to read and write and think. It's just absolutely wonderful. And um, so I just want to put that on the record here. Also, it's been fantastic to be able to uh, renew acquaintances with old friends in, in Washington, in different parts of the State Department, in, different, in the universities here and elsewhere in the United States. I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity. Um, as Bob is going to be a stickler for time, I'm going to rush on and probably go quite fast. I apologize in advance. So my project here at the Woodrow Wilson Center has been about the interrelationship of social change in North Korea, social change, not political change, uh, with uh, North Korean government politics 
and whether that has any consequences for US foreign policy. Um, just as background, though I'm not going to talk about it today, I've looked at social change in North Korea from the perspective of four analytical categories, social class and occupation, gender, age, and geographical provenance. By that I mean whereabouts you come from within North Korea. And change, when I'm talking, when I'm talking about social change, I'm talking about from the famine years of the early 1990s, um, what's happened since then. But in this bit of the talk, I focus on American foreign policy. That's the uh, part of the project that I've been doing. Now, normally, I avoid talking about American foreign policy in Washington, D.C., <laughs> for very obvious reasons. Um, but uh, because often you end up on a platform with somebody who knows a lot more about it than you do and who is, has been involved in making and shaping that policy for a long period of time, and this is exactly what's happened today. And um, I, I, I address this topic with great nervousness. But nevertheless, um, I've been working on the issue for 25 years, so I, I, I will um, say a little bit about, about what I can think of the, the issues of today's. Um, from the perspective of smart power, smart power now is somewhat of a buzzword in Washington, D.C. Uh, most of you will know it was coined and popularized by Joseph Nye, a scholar and uh, policy, somebody who's been influential in U.S. policy and U.N. policy. Uh, but how it's worked out in the U.S. policy arena has been to focus on the resource element of, of soft power, of smart power. Uh, the idea that hard power, which is military capability, economic sanctions, should be combined with soft power, things like diplomacy and foreign aid, pow power as resources. But I think what people forget is that Joseph Nye was also interested in uh, smart power as strategy uh, and smart power as, uh, as, uh, an, an uh, as a way to have an outcome which a desired outcome which could use the instruments of soft power and hard power. So smart power in this sense is simply a, a strategy that has a fighting chance of achieving objectives. And it's a bit of that that I want to talk about today. Now, uh, what about US foreign policy since the early 1990s? And again, I speak as clearly as an outsider. Uh, the major objective has been counter-proliferation of nuclear weapons, um, and also human security objectives have been on the agenda. Human rights concerns ha have been raised, although they've largely been delinked from proliferation negotiations, um, and human rights campaigning has generally been decentralized to, to NGOs and to campaigning groups. Humanitarian aid has also been part of the policy at different points of time, uh, although it's mainly end in, ended up being stuck together with diplomatic negotiations. So what's the record in achieving US foreign policy objectives, proliferation, and human security objectives? Um, well, clearly, counter-proliferation policies haven't succeeded. And this isn't to say that it's not a difficult issue, but they haven't succeeded. We have North Korea as a nuclear weapon state. It wasn't at the beginning of the 1990s, and now is. North Korea's missile development program still continues. And of concern, and something which we have m a lot less evidence of, is, but, the, but we still have the concern that North Korea, it's non-transparent, may be sharing its technological knowledge with other states which are of concern to the US and other states. So on proliferation, it's, it's, um, it's probably, um, it's a work in progress. On human rights, uh, what's happened in North Korea is that we've seen on the socioeconomic sector, in terms of poverty indicators such as child mortality, maternal mortality, malnutrition rates, there have been considerable improvements since the early 1990s. We've got lots of data on this. On the political sector, not much change. And in fact, many, many, in many ways, things have got worse. The increasing focus on youth, either to send them to the army uh, or to organize them in continuous uh, economic uh, mobilization and campaigning activity and civil defense activity, has, has really uh, been disastrous for, for, these, for these young people in North Korea. But I think on, in terms of linking those outcomes to US foreign policy or any other foreign policy, but the US is the most important player, I think it's very doubtful that we can say that outside campaigning has had much influence on either of those two outcomes, social, economic, social outcomes or political outcomes. Humanitarian policy. What about the outcomes in this part of US foreign policy? Well, US foreign policy has been very active in this area and was very generous, uh, uh, in, especially in the 1990s. Um, the problem is, is that humanitarian aid discussions have got very complicated in that they've got combined uh, with uh, the diplomatic negotiations on proliferation. And complicated, I think, for the United States because the open use of humanitarian aid as an instrument of diplomacy is illegal 
under international law. If humanitarian aid is given to any country, it must be given on the grounds of humanitarian need only, and donor states may not interfere in the recipient country's politics. Now, this is very different for development aid. Development aid, can, you can have you know, conditionality coming out of the, you know, whatever. But, uh, uh, and so th there are complications there for U.S. foreign policy, not just in North Korea, but in the uh, implications for international law uh, of the... I'm not saying this is, there's not real reasons why this has happened, but I'm just trying to go through the record. So, so on, on outcomes, in terms of U.S. foreign policy outcomes, some problematic outcomes, and probably I think there's not a U.S. foreign policy maker that you talk to internally that wishes there weren't better outcomes here. So where does that leave us? A foreign policy objective is still counter-proliferation, and in my view should still include human security I issues like human rights. Um, but... I think, ha going back to smart power, having a smart strategy means devising a game plan that combines objectives with the very diverse foreign policy instruments that are available to the United States. And these, of course, include military force, threats of military force, economic sanctions, aid, multilateral and bilateral diplomacy, even cultural diplomacy. And, of course, in a democracy, which the United States is and North Korea isn't, where there are competing and urgent problems on the agenda, the economy, Afghanistan, Iraq, and the United States... You know, for, for, a, for a policy where, where there's so much emotion and there's so many different interests um, with, within the government, within the society, it probably means having a, a top-level attention to see North Korea as, as, a, as a really top, uh, a top priority in order for political capital to be expended to use some of these instruments. So a smart strategy asks the question then, how, how do we, and here I want to be an honorary American here <laughs> because I think I share these objectives, how do we achieve national interest objectives? How does, the, how does America achieve its national interests in the context of non, wanting to achieve non-proliferation, counter-proliferation, end of nuclear, missile, nuclear development, missile development, human rights uh, uh, improvements? Well, one answer, of course, is to go to war. Um, smart strategies don't preclude the use of force, surgical military strikes, whatever. But if the costs of war are too great, or the assessment, which has more or less been the internal assessment in the United States and in South Korea for the last 20 years, that war is not in the national interest for all sorts of reasons, what next? Now, one thing that probably doesn't really get discussed very much, and this is what I want to talk about a little bit, is what do the North Koreans want? Uh, and can their interests, in any level, coincide with the interests of the United States? And so I want to put that on the agenda here in the 15, 10 minutes I've got left. So what do they want? Um, overall, what they want is a cast-iron security guarantee that there's going to be no military intervention in North Korea. And probably at this stage, different from before, they want it entrenched in a treaty. Why do they want this? Well, they're, they're, the scope of their thinking is long-term. It's not a democracy where they are, you know, they're bound by every four years by regime governmental changes. They fear the United States. Uh, I'm not saying whether this is right or wrong. I'm just saying this is how they think. And the context for them is still the Korean War. Uh, it's, it still has an impact on, of 1950 to 53. It still has a major impact on their country uh, in, and their society demographically, for example. Uh, our elder men uh, simply don't exist. When you look at the population curve in North Korea, they're, they're not there. Um, the North Korean negotiators have been through a lot of U.S. administrations. Again, not a democracy, so the, the people negotiating at the top don't change very much. And they've seen, you know, several U.S. presidents standing at the DMZ for the photo op with the military jacket on saying we will bomb them into the ground if they don't do this or the other. Uh, they're fully aware of U.S. politics, much more sophisticated appreciation of U.S. politics than probably we hear about in the press. Uh, they're quite aware of the regime change agenda that is part and parcel of the discourse. I'm not saying it's, ever, it's dominant. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't in the United States. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but they're aware of it. And what they consider, and again, whether it's right or wrong is, is hardly the point in some ways, they consider is that uh, military intervention in Iraq was only possible and in Libya because these countries gave up their weapons of mass destruction. They were also shocked by the fall of Mubarak, as they knew that he'd been a staunch ally of the United States. And they consider, uh, we, can, we can say how that's waxed and waned, it's gone up and down, that military intervention in the North Korea is not off the cards for the United States. Okay, that's their view. And it's the, the intensity of those different perspectives has changed over time, but that's their overall view. Um, it's probably worth stating that North Korea's strategic goal is or was unification of the Korean Peninsula, but for some time that goal has been submerged under the overall priority of regime survival, over, uh, over and above everything else. 
In the Kim Il-sung period, as, as you all know, North Korea didn't worry too much about strategic goals. It was covered by the uh, un uh, Soviet Union uh, nuclear umbrella. And all this changed, of course, in 1990 when Shevardnadze told um, Pyongyang that they were no, lo no longer could rely on Soviet help, and that in fact the USSR was going to have, going to have um, diplomatic relations with South Korea. Another major uh, change in North Korea's circumstance uh, in their thinking was the, Iraq, the first Iraq War of 1990 to 91. Now, I'm old enough to remember this, but many of you will not be. But those of you that study international relations will know that the Iraqi army was, was very large, like the North Korean army is today. It had about a million people, conscripts and militias. And it was seen, before, uh, it was seen as powerful. Mm -hmm. And the North Koreans were, in, were shocked when it disintegrated in, in, in February 1991. Um, and similarly to the to the North Korean army, it was com com today it was composed of a lot of people that get their basic rations, but they're not very happy with having to shove them their time away and their twenties away in the army. So another major lesson for the North Koreans of the, drawn from the early 1990s was actually this large army that they had could not they couldn't rely on it to defend the regime. And another lesson was that their former allies, including China, not just Russia, were untrustworthy. So we go on then to, uh, they couldn't rely on them basically in terms of war, if there was war. So the 1990s, we all know, so economic collapse at the beginning of the 1990s, and the biggest change that took place in the North Korea's domestic politics since North Korea was created as a state in 1948 took place in the late 1990s, which put the military in control of the executive. This is very unusual in communist states and Soviet Union and everywhere else, and even in Kim Il-sung states, the military is kept outside domestic politics. And despite periodic efforts by civilians, party, ex-party leadership, poor party leaderships to claw back decision-making, the last decade and a half has basically constituted by a military dictatorship at home and abroad. Um, and hence also, when we're thinking about the power of Kim Jong-un, we have to think about his power as very, very constrained uh, by that military dictatorship. So uh, what happens now is that um, all, these, all these different... Uh, varieties of thinking within North Korea coincide in the fact they don't rely on the army, they've got military control in domestic politics, they consider their allies are untrustworthy, and uh, so they think, well, what can we do next? Well, we've got a technologically literate population, 100% numeracy and, and, uh, and, uh, and literacy, and massive tertiary education, a hugely developed scientific education, of course, not much in critical social science, in fact, none. And so what can we do? Well, we'll develop a bomb. We, we will go for the nuclear option. Now, and many of you know much more than I the, the vagaries of the up and ups and downs of negotiations between the United States and North Korea on denuclearization since then. The North Koreans, and again, from their perspective, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, they thought, I, I have some stories, but I'm not going to say these on the webcast, they thought they were very, they thought Bill Clinton was wonderful by the end of the administration. They were, I was in living in in North Korea, but I was actually in the north of the country when Madeleine Albright came to, to Pyongyang, so I, I didn't meet her, but they really thought that they were on the cards for a security guarantee here, and in fact, Bill Clinton, President Clinton gave them a letter, communique, which gave what they thought, them, what they thought was a, was a, st a good step in the right direction, security guarantee. Again, North Koreans are in their diplomacy are often naive as well as strategic, you know, well, te tactical more than strategic. Uh, when George Bush came in, democratic country, and said this communique doesn't apply to us, uh, they were pretty shocked. They didn't like the axis of evil speech very much. Uh, and they also rejected the policy of what, which they saw as unconditional disarmament, uh, uh, which is known in the US as CIVD, comprehensive, you know, et cetera, et cetera, verifiable disarmament, because they saw this as, as just um, giving, up, uh, giving up their sovereignty. In the meantime, of course, in the 2000s, in Afghanistan and Iraq was invaded. And this put to bed the myth that had grown up under the Clinton administration that the United States would not risk human lives after the Somalia debacle. Um, and also, um, in this period, also the, the North Korean negotiators became, became much more aware of the stumbling blocks facing an American president when you have a Congress in place that doesn't want to support its policy. So, for instance, the fuel deliveries under the Cato Agreement were always late because uh, to, to North Korea. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the president had to, to pay for them out of uh, special funds, couldn't get the money through Congress. And the North Koreans became more aware of this. Now, of course, at the end of the Bush administration, uh, serious negotiations with the United States were revived. The North Koreans, I'm not talking about the six-party talks here. I'm talking about the, the uh, Ambassador Hill's interventions with, with the United States. 
And there were, I think, uh, I know that this is a hugely controversial subject in Washington, but I, again, I will say that I think that there were very, very, m there was very, very major progress made. The North Koreans blew up part of their nuclear plant. Um, American State Department officials and others were in Pyongyang for weeks on end. There were pages and pages of documentation that came out of Pyongyang. It wasn't perfect. Presumably they were trying to hide some things. I'm sure they were, but there was certain progress made. Um, all this came to naught when, from their perspective, and again, I'm not saying this is right or wrong, American negotiators demanded in 2008 uh, unconditional and open-ended verification procedures, which North Koreans asked, uh, said that they wanted to negotiate as they went along. Now, I know, and we're going to hear from Ambassador Cheney, how wrong they all were, but I'm saying that this is the perspective. Okay, um, Their view was that this was, this was bad faith, that this was like, uh, them lying down and crying uncle, the famous phrase that Ronald Reagan once used, um, and they, they, they thought that whatever happened with uh, the presidential goodwill, and I think President Bush and Condoleezza Rice were interested in having a deal, that the, con the forces within domestic politics in the United States, in Congress and the administration, would always put forward spoiler clauses and so forth, things are not, we're not going to get done. 2008, uh, President Obama comes in, and we have uh, bilateral channels with South Korea, which become less functional. I haven't had time to go into the overall, the, the East Asian regional framework, but the, I just haven't got time. But, uh, and um, we have a, a policy of strategic patience from the Obama administration, which involved periods of inaction, punctuated by diplomatic initiatives, some of them secret, some of them not so secret. Perhaps the high point and the low point at the same time was the February 2012 bilateral agreement where the North Koreans um, and, and the U United States, and again, I, uh, this is talked about, I don't think it's ever been on the record, the public statements, I don't know, um, where, where the US thought they'd got an agreement and the, and the, and the DPRK said, well, yeah, oh, come on, we can still have the right to peaceful exploration of space and we're going to launch a satellite. Of course, it's clearly anti all the Security Council resolutions, clearly against international law. Uh, and um, whereas in the past there had been some ambiguity about international law, there was certainly no ambiguity about the fact that they were flying, they were contravening international law uh, in 2012. Now, given all that, given these North Korean perspectives, which I want to talk about, not because I, they're a major part of my work, but simply because I don't think they often get aired in, 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 in a serious manner in Washington or in the rest of the world, in the UK. So what might a, start st a smart strategy towards North Korea look like? Well, you know, I'm a fan of the writings of Dr. Kissinger. Uh, those of you that have read his, his, uh, his PhD thesis, which publishes The World Restored, are, are familiar with the balance of power stuff. And um, I think that his practice when he was in office was incredibly far-sighted, very, you know, he's, a, he's a, often seen as the father of realism in, in the scholarly sense. Uh, and, and sometimes we need to get back to basics when, when I think we're dealing with, uh, with difficult, difficult countries. Um, and I think what, what Dr. Kissinger tells us, and he wrote a book on diplomacy, a number of essays, is that um, if you use diplomacy, it's not about dealing with your allies, that's negotiations. Diplomacy is about coming to an agreement with an adversary whose values and interests you do not share. You do not share. Now, this military might and economic capacity is not irrelevant to the practice of diplomacy, and in the case of North Korea, America certainly has far more foreign policy instruments available to it than North Korea, and this, these all instruments help when pushing forward a diplomatic agenda. But I think the practice of diplomacy does mean identifying what are fundamental national interests, both yours and theirs. I always say to my students, I have students taught international relations the last 25 years and security, you know, if you, and I often have a lot of Greeks and Turks in the same class, and I say, you have to argue for the other side, you're not much interested as use as a policy analyst if you can't show what the other side is, is thinking, then you can devise a policy to respond to it. But diplomacy means um, that you assess whether there is a way to achieve compromise which will give you what you want, what you want on your fundamentals, but maybe not all of them, but, and which will give them a bit of what they want in terms of concessions which do not dilute the fundamentals of your own negotiating objective. And I think that that's good to remind ourselves that about diplomacy. Now, what about strategic patience? Now, if I may have a view on this, I really don't think that this is a policy or a strategy. Uh, one of the things that, you know, you know if you've studied management studies or, or is that the, if you don't take decisions, somebody else will take them for you. Uh, and I think the worst consequences are that it allows others, the most vocal, maybe not the most informed or the most well-meaning, to set the agenda. In the case of North Korea, it relies on, you know, under, fundamentally relies on China to do the job. Uh, and in, in fact, I think that um, 
China, of course, does support non, uh, non-proliferation and even social uh, political change in North Korea to a certain extent, uh, but it does have different national interests from, from that of the United States, and it's certainly not going to act as an instrument of the United States' national interest. In other words, it shares some objectives, but it has other other objectives. And I'm often in, in Washington and I hear people say, feeling really bewildered that China's not doing what you know they, they're supposed to. But actually... I think that um, this isn't, doesn't have to be good or bad. We don't have to be normative about it. It's just that they have different strategic and national interests. Um, and some of them coincide. They don't necessarily have to be oppositional, but some are simply different. So I think in terms of US foreign policy, what would smart power do? Uh, I, I, I apologize for this because I, I'm not a US citizen. But So this is only as a scholar. And, um, and, and actually, I'm very fond of this country. I've lived here several years. And... And um, I think that that, um, that America is uh, c- can be bigger than and should be bigger than North Korea, really. Uh, okay, so a smart power objective should be to, I think, a treaty to end the Korean War. This has been talked out about on and off within the United States for years, and the means, of course, would need to have under, underpinning it cooperation across the aisle, uh, both at home and abroad. And, I would argue that a special em- we've had loads of these, but a special envoy coordinator with real clout and knowledge uh, needs to be appointed whose mission is to secure a peace treaty. And if I had to throw a name into the hat, remember, I'm not like you all responsible, so I can do it. I would say somebody like Senator Richard Lugar, who was uh, with, the, with, the, with the Lugar Nun uh, d- uh, initiatives on um, nuclear non-proliferation, made fantastic contributions to to world peace, to stability, to US foreign policy uh, in the period of time that he was active. Um, I think the negotiating process should be explicitly about the strategic end of securing a peace treaty, not just focused on denuclearization. And the reason for that is that nuclearization is simply, it's a a second order issue actually for the North Koreans. I mean, it's not a, um, in other words, unless they think that, unless they think that it's about a treaty or a security guarantee or them not being invaded, then there's no way that one can find a way to share interests. So they will end up evading uh, any agreement just on nuclearization. I think human rights should be left on the agenda, uh, but perhaps in a separate basket of negotiating objectives, as in the end of the, uh, the Helsinki Agreement, where these two between the Soviet Union and the, and the USSR and other powers, where these things were separated out. And this might sound controversial coming from me, because I've worked on humanitarian aid, and I've worked in the country of humanitarian aid. I think humanitarian aid to North Korea should be taken right off the agenda. I, I, it shouldn't be given any. It simply muddies the waters for U.S. foreign policy. North Koreans are actually not facing a public health emergency right now. And if we want to use economic instruments, I say we, the grand we, we should be thinking about development assistance, which, which you, we should have condition, full conditionality and transparency attached to. And that's not impossible. Um, um, now, why is all this important right now? Why have I gone away from the scholarly literature from my brief? I apologize for that to a certain extent. I'm really, really worried about the flippant way that North Korea is dealt with in the international media, in the non-serious discussion. And I am really get really worried, and you might say, I would, wouldn't I, <laughs> that with all the various priorities on the agenda for the, for the major power in the world, that, um, that Afghanistan, Iraq, the economy, that, uh, that terrorism, that North Korea slips off the top of the agenda, and... Um, I'm aware, again, I'm a taught international relations for 25 years, that wars simply don't, don't, sometimes, don't happen always by volition. They sometimes happen through accident or, or, or escalation. Now, what we have in the situation now is that if there is a military incident on the land border or the maritime border, say as there was in 2002 when people got shot and killed, there was, there was a diplomatic space between North and South Korea where they immediately went to resolve the political issue. There was, there was peaceful diplomatic re- resolution. And that, that doesn't exist right now. Also, there are questions of when you've got an accelerating nuclear program in North Korea of a nuclear accident. You can imagine that if you have a nuclear accident in Fukushima, one of the most developed countries in the world, what do you think is happening internally in the development of the nuclear program in North Korea where they have no engineering quality assurance procedures to, to, to speak of uh, and where there's plenty of room for human error uh, and where the system is such as happened at Chernobyl that there will be delays in reporting an accident because they'll all be frightened of reporting up to the, to the leader and to the military and also they have no equipment as Russia had to come in and, and, and take control of a nuclear accident. They'd have to ask for help from outside and they would be reluctant to do that. So I think that 
th this is the time, really, and, and uh, so this is the, the, the reason I've strayed off the scholarly bit of my agenda and talked about the empirics of US foreign policy. I hope you'll forgive me for that, because I'm, I'm in your country, and, and I, I, but I, I have something I hope will be useful to say. And I think you know, it, it, it bears repeating that American leadership uh, is, uh, is, is crucial to anything that's going to happen in the future. The regional powers, including Japan and, and China and uh, South Korea, understand this. I think the regional powers, some of the regional powers in the past, including Japan, have been worried that they've been kept off the agenda when things have been negotiated, but that isn't a fundamental reason why America does, can't, shouldn't be taking leadership. But I think it does mean the, the, the expenditure of political capital, and um, who knows? I mean, I, I don't know whether that will, will take place. So thank you for listening to me. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for being here. And over to the real expert now, to Ambassador Cheney. Well, j before we go to, uh, to Joe, um, Hazel, um, thank you for a very lucid, provocative presentation. I expect there'll be lots of uh, people who want to push you a little bit on things. I'll look forward to that. Um, we've been joined by uh, my boss, the president and director of the Wilson Center, Jane Harmon. Jane, would you like to say anything? This, is, this showcases this kind of event, what the Wilson Center does best. Uh, we understand uh, these problems in depth. We invite the world's experts to share their wisdom. Uh, we have the best scholars. We have the best program directors. Uh, and I'm just proud to, to learn from these things. Thank you. Joe. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, uh, Dr. Smith. That was excellent. I don't. Well, let me just say a few things. Uh, let me just lead off by saying uh, I think we're going through a very sad, certainly for me, this is a very, uh, and I think for all of us here, it's, it's a very unfortunate series of events we've been seeing going on. For me, personally, it's very sad because I think we were very close to coming to, uh, to an agreement with the DPRK and we would be moving towards eventually normal, no, a normal relationship. And what we've done, what's going on now is is, as I said, uh, extremely disheartening, and hopefully we'll get back on the path. Uh, North Korea will get back on the path, and we'll move forward. But I, I'd like to address what the, uh, the, the topic for the uh, uh, session, this uh, seminar this afternoon, uh, North Korea's foreign policy options and U.S. policy options. Let me start with North Korea's foreign policy options. And then ju just, just these, these are things you know, and many of you in the room here are certainly very expert on, on, on these issues and this will come out in the uh, discussion we have subsequent to our presentations. But, you know, we, we saw two missile launches, and as Dr. Smith indicated, they were in violation of UN Security Council resolutions. We saw that in April, and we saw it in December of 2012, and then we saw a, a nuclear test in February of 2013, all in violation of UN Security Council resolutions. The UN Security Council uh, met, and there were uh, resolutions, and 193 countries signed up to them. China helped draft it. Consequences for violating these UN Security Council resolutions. Now, this is this is a uh, unanimity on, on on this account here. So this is this is part of what North Korea is addressing, the sanctions part of it. They are, they've always been angered with sanctions that are coming down, and this is understandable for a country. But they also also understand there are consequences, and you can't be a member of a, an international organization and say, well, then the rules don't apply to us. There's, there's either a standard for all, or it, it, it really is it's not a functional organization. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me indicate what I think North Korea, they have many policy options, obviously, and no one has a crystal ball. No one really knows who's whispering in the ear of Kim Jong-un and, and how independent he is of, of, of many of the uh, senior military people around him. I believe he is. Uh, a leader who is in power. I think he has shown s significant leadership right from the get-go. December of 2012, when he took over, he made some major decisions on personnel moves. He, re he eliminated a number of senior military officers and put others in there. He put a, he put a, a, a party officer uh, in charge of the general political department of the K Korean People's Army. And to me, that was bold. So, I mean, I don't think, I don't think anyone doubts the fact that this man is, 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 is proving uh, uh, he's, he's the, the leader. He is the ultimate decision maker. That does not mean, however, 
that he's not sensitive to those around him. It doesn't mean, however, that he's, uh, he, <laughs> he didn't have much time, as his father had over 12, 13 years to be groomed by uh, uh, Kim Il-sung when Kim Jong-il took over. Uh, Kim Jong-un had a bit over a year of grooming. That doesn't, that's, it doesn't really prepare you to build that infrastructure, that, that loyal element that you would want to look to and, and to ensure that people know you and know your vision. So he's, it's, it's still, it's, it's something that's being developed. And no one wants to be a psychologist on this, but this is pretty obvious when you see it. But again, he's a man who, who, who displays leadership. Uh, he's, a, he's more gregarious, certainly, than his father. He's very reminiscent of Kim Il-sung, his grandfather, in demeanor and behavior and decision-making and the decisions he took. And Kim Il-sung, when he came in, uh, was also very hard on those who were around him. He purged, eliminated a number of people, as did uh, Kim Jong-un initially. So what are some of the options he's looking at? Well, I, I think the number one option is we all relent. He becomes a nuclear weapon state. What a legacy. Something his father, Kim Jong-il, aspired to but then committed to denuclearization. North Korea becomes a nuclear weapon state. He said this. He said it most recently when he said that it's the bifurcated path. Economic development on one side, we'll work on that and we'll enhance our nuclear weapons capability on the other side. Now, okay, well, you know, if one were to accept that, let's think of, the, the, let's think of what follows. Think of what's going on in the region. Think of what's going on, whether it's in the Republic of Korea, whether it's in Japan, whether it's in the People's Republic of China. I don't think these countries in Taiwan or Indonesia, they're just going to sit there and North Korea builds its nuclear weapons capabilities. I mean, this is a North Korea that exported a five megawatt reactor to Al-Kabar in Syria. Ladies and gentlemen, if it wasn't for the Israelis in September 2007, we could be sitting here looking at a, at a Syria with a nuclear weapons capability. Now, proliferation has to come to mind. It's one thing saying, we're a responsible nuclear weapon state, and so be it. It's another thing to look at the reality, the reality of the potential for a nuclear arms race in the region, because I don't think other countries, in my personal view, these are all my personal views. I've been out of government for over a year. These are all my views. But having worked it for over 10 years, I, I don't think South Korea or, or Japan or others are just going to sit there and say, well, that's great. Let, let North Korea enhance its nuclear weapons capability, and that's fine. Hopefully they'll come back to the NPT and hopefully there'll be IAEA monitors and hopefully there's IAEA monitors will get out of Yongbyon because heretofore the IAEA monitors were never permitted outside of Yongbyon. Well, sure, we'll have a verification protocol, but you can't leave this one location. No, no, wait a minute, no, wait a minute. Let's be responsible, let's be, let's be logical here. A nuclear arms race in the region. I, I mentioned the proliferation piece, and I'm not only talking about state actors, I'm talking about non-state actors. You put that amount of fissile material out there and what have you. So is this, is this the environment we're looking at? I, I, don't, I don't think anyone wants to go down that path. I think that's where the United Nations uh, Security Council was when they passed the resolutions. I think this is where the NPT and the IEA and all those who subscribe to, uh, to the, the, the tenets of the non-proliferation regime. So, North Korea, in my view, thinks we will blink. I personally believe that. I, I think we have, to a great extent, have conditioned the DPRK to think that eventually we will relent. And if they threaten enough and they, uh, and they uh, intimidate sufficiently, we'll find a way of defusing it and then giving them something in return whether it's economic assistance, and, and this is not just for, it's the United States was part of this, Republic of Korea, Japan, and certainly the People's Republic of China. So what have they been conditioned? Now this was under Kim Jong-il. Kim Jong-un is coming in a different time. I don't think anyone's prepared to do that any longer. I don't think anyone's prepared to cave in. I don't think anyone wants to be intimidated. I don't think anyone wants to be threatened. I don't think anyone in the United States wants to hear someone say, we're going to preemptively strike you with a nuclear weapon. I don't think anyone wants to see on YouTube where they wipe out New York City with a nuclear weapon. I don't think so. That's responsible behavior. We should applaud that and reward that and say, yeah, maybe you'll be a responsible nuclear weapon state. What are we thinking? So 
what would they look for? Except this is a nuclear weapon state. They've said that. They've said that to me many times. And to others, treat us the way you treat other countries and we'll be responsible and we'll be a very, very good friend. But it's your behavior, it's the, uh, the behavior that counts. And I just mentioned al Kabar, and I can go down a list of other things and I, I will not, with the, certainly with the missile programs and, 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 and so forth. What are the other options? Well, I immediately go to September 19, 2005, the joint statement. This has been worked on. We had the agreed framework in 1994, and I think Ambassador Bob Gallucci and his team did great work in halting what was going on in Yongbyon. Unfortunately, we had, we had issues in 2002. Let's face it, the reality is because North Korea had a clandestine uranium enrichment program. It's in violation of the NPT, where you have to declare if your intent is to, is to require this material eventually to enrich uranium. It certainly was in violation of the spirit of the agreed framework and the North-South 1991 uh, declaration. So, I mean, it, it wasn't that the agreed framework just went off course. There was an issue that was put on the table. It was put on gently. No one was accusing anyone of enriching uranium or using that uranium to build nuclear weapons. We were just saying, gee, why not? And that lent itself to the dissolution of the, basically the agreed framework, walking away from the NPT. I was involved with Cato. We, we suspended construction of the two 1,000 megawatt light water reactors at Kumho. We stopped shipment of the heavy fuel oil, which was, was to be provided to North Korea until they had the two light water reactors. So there was a reason behind this, this series of events. China came in in April of 2003 and defused it because it got very tense, ladies and gentlemen. They said what they said. They said then what they said now. We'll make Seoul a sea of flames. Defused. China brought North Korea, the U.S., themselves to the table, and we had started with the, uh, with the uh, six-party talks. Eventually, we got to the September 19, 2005 joint statement. And that, it wasn't, it wasn't one-sided. It wasn't when you denucle denuclearize fully, we will give you a security assurances and we'll give you economic aid. Nonsense. Uh, this is simultaneous. We, what, what it was was actions for actions. The North Koreans were insisting, and we agreed. Security assurances, economic assistance, the provision the discussion for the provision of light water reactors, which we stopped building at Kumho, when North Korea gave up its nuclear weapons and came back to the NPT as a non-nuclear weapon state. North Korea signed up to this. Kim Jong-il, when he was in Beijing, signed up to this. Kim Jong-il, when he was in Beijing, signed up to denuclearization. Mind you, I've never heard, I may be missing this, but I've never heard Kim Jong-un commit to the September 2005 joint statement or commit to denuclearization, as his father did, as his father did. So that's another option. Come back to that and become a, a, a legit, legitimate nation state. You get all those security assurances, economic assurances. Ultimately, normal, normal relations. But let me add this on normal relations. Let me be very clear on this. Normal relations, that was not the quid for denuclearization. Denuclearization was a path to normal relations, a path, and they would get those other benefits. But when a country counterfeits your currency, when a country counterfeits your pharmaceuticals and your cigarettes, and they deal in methamphetamine, and, I won't, and, and we know the gulags, the 200,000 plus people in gulags and so forth, we have our values too. And what we would say is, no, that's not normal. We would move towards normalization when there's transparency and movement on those other issues because we can't have you doing that. We can't have you counterfeiting our currency and doing these other things. When you have movement on that, we'll move there. But the sign of Quanon is we've got to move towards denuclearization. And that's the September 2004 joint We all signed up to that. That's a very powerful option, I think, for Kim Jong-un. It's on the table. It's available. China was very instrumental in the drafting of this. I give a lot of credit to China in the drafting of this 2005 joint statement, September 2005 joint statement. Another one. Option they have is, look, no one wants anyone to lose face because we know there's, there's a lot in play here for North Korea, for the leadership in North Korea. No one wants anyone to lose face. That's a very, that's a very important factor. I think China has, has inserted itself. I think we've heard from President Xi Jinping over the weekend. I'm sure that China behind the scenes is doing what they can. We have a, 
uh, new foreign minister, Wang Yi, he was intimate. He led the, uh, the uh, six-party negotiations initially. We have Yang Jiechi, who is the uh, state councilor, who was the foreign minister, who was intimate with these issues. I think China, behind the scenes, is working it. But as they did it so effectively in 2003, a path for Kim Jong-il is sit, come and, and talk and say, OK, let's, let's, let's sort of go on a different tack here, because this is not the right tack. Because I think, I think Kim Jong-un and the North Korean leadership knows no one's going to cave. No one's, be, no one's going to be intimidated. It's not going to happen. And they, I, I, they hear from the new, the, the new president, Park geun hye She's been articulate. And this is, a, this is a president who's put a hand on and said, we can negotiate. We can discuss these things. And this is the response. So the hand is still out there. But hopefully, we don't see another, anything of a kinetic nature, further aggression. Hopefully, nothing even similar to two, not only even similar, because I think 2010 was gross to take down a frigate, 46 sailors dead, to shell an island, civilians dead. That's not state's behavior. But certainly there'll be response, response from the RK, from the international community, and so forth. So I think, I think and I agree with Dr. Smith totally, there could be small moves. Some could say, you say face if you do a little something here, and, and that will be enough, and they sort of don't do anything, and you can say, look, I've shown how tough I am and everything. But, but no one's going to put up with anything, even if it's a small move. It's of a kinetic nature, and you're talking about casualties. No, no one's going to do that. So there's a danger in, in stumbling into something that will escalate, which will escalate and be catastrophic. And that's what we're concerned with. Right? That's certainly I, having worked this issue, and I'm, I'm sure all the countries are concerned. We're, we wouldn't be here today if we weren't concerned. We don't want to stumble into anything. We want to move towards a negotiated, peaceful settlement to these issues. There are 24 million people in North Korea who are suffering. The malnutrition rate is significant. We talked about not only starvation in the 1990s, the mid-90s were over 1 million people. We're talking about even, even periods, most, most recent periods of the last few months where there have been elements, pockets of, of, of potential starvation. So this is not what we want. We want we want North Korea to come into the fold. So the September 2005 joint statement's there. China hopefully can, uh, because China has a, a very unique relationship, let's not deny it, and China is doing some good work, I'm, I'm sure. But I mean, a country that has a peace and friendship treaty, uh, they're allied with them, and they provide you know, over 30 to 50,000 tons of oil uh, each month to North Korea. I mean, there are levers there. The levers we don't have in the United States, or the ROK, or, J or Japan. So th that's, that's a possibility. U.S. policy options. I'm not going to speak for U.S. policy options. I don't do U.S. policy. But let me just say one thing. I personally think, my personal view, the present course makes eminent sense. We're not inciting anyone. What we're saying very clearly to the DPRK is that we have a relationship with our allies in East Asia, certainly the Republic of Korea and Japan. We will protect the homeland no matter what. We are there, and just remember that. And remember that. So the alliance is, is powerful. We're not beating anyone's chest or anything like that. We're saying we're, we're here to defend ourselves, and there would be consequences. And the consequences. I personally think the path is on. If we, and, and, and let me just divert a little on that. When we say we haven't reached out to North Korea, I mean, if I remember the, uh, the February 29th, 2012, Leap Day Agreement, we did reach out to North Korea. We had a moratorium. We had an agreement there. And we also, President Clinton's name was mentioned. President Clinton personally went into North Korea a number of years ago and had dinner with Kim Jong-il and returned with the two journalists. Remember, Gen President Clinton did go into North Korea to return. So this administration has been forward-leaning. As of the Leap Day Agreement, February 2000. And 12. So the present course, because we have to be there with our allies, we have to be there, we have to, we, and we have to get that message across to, uh, to uh, North Korea. Um, you know, um, hopefully this North Korea will cease and desist, and they'll go on a different tack. And hopefully China, working with all of us, will help to move them in that direction. Because what we do want is 
normal relations, ultimately normal relations with the DPRK. And if it's the September 2005 joint statement, so be it. If it's not, let's come up with a new architecture <clears throat> to ensure that they have the security assurances, the economic assistance, and, and all the other benefits necessary, and ultimately norm, a normal relationship, so they're not the, not the pariah state. Last comments I'll make. I personally do believe the, uh, the Songun policy, the, the military first policy, is alive and well. It's totally understandable. As Dr. Smith indicated, this has been the po policy in the, in the DPRK, many other countries. It's the, uh, the party that controls the gun. In this case here, it's the, the military that's, that's, been, uh, that's been critical in doing that, that policy. So a lot of, I would believe, a lot of what's happening or a good portion of what's happening in North Korea now has to do with the circle around Kim Jong-un. He's put a lot of different people in there. These individuals are min the National Defense Commission, the Ministry of Defense. He's put a new Minister of Defense, a new Minister of State Security. So the security services, the uh, Korean People's Army, these are very, very strong elements uh, advising. And many of these people have not been out of the country. A very few have been outside of the country, even to China. So, you know, hopefully they, they get a, a broader view, and he's listening to those who have a broader view, listening to those who have been into China to see what the economic, China's economic reform movement was and is and how powerful it was with Deng Xiaoping. And Jiang Sung Tech certainly was one of the few, one of the individuals who was with his father in China a, n a number of times. So um, let me just sort of uh, end on that. I think the, uh, the options for North Korea are pretty obvious. I think the path we're on is a, is a, is a smart, a logical path. Uh, I, I think uh, we, and I agree with Dr. Smith, the concern here is that uh, any form of escalation could lend itself to something totally unanticipated, unexpected, and that could be very catastrophic. And that's certainly not where we want to be. I thank, thank the Wilson Center for in, uh, inviting me here today, and uh, thank you all for attending. Well, thank you, uh, Joe and Hazel. Uh, we'll hold our applause until the end because you both uh, uh, deserve uh, applause. I I'm going to exercise an extraordinary bit of self-restraint by not asking several questions which I want to ask uh, and immediately uh, open it up to those of you uh, on the floor. Um, I would ask that you wait till we get a microphone to you, uh, that you briefly identify yourself and that you keep your questions and or comments uh, brief, please, please. We'll go right here, first of all. I'm going to take two questions for starters. Uh, we're going to take two on this side, and then we'll go back over there. Hi. My name is Oliver Grimm. I'm uh, the U.S. correspondent for an Austrian newspaper called Die Presse. Um, my question is to Hazel Smith. Um, how could such um, a negotiation to end the Korean War be initiated now? Could you give us some some estimate how in the current situation one should go about that to initiate such talks. Thank you. Okay, let's have another question on this side. If I see a hand, do I see a hand on this side? Okay. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Jeffrey. I run a nonprofit um, doing economics training on the ground in North Korea. Um, just out of curiosity, I want to know if um, any of the speakers could shed some light on kind of the role of the National Defense Commission or Organization and Guidance Department in terms of policy making or implementation in North Korea, and whether you know specifically like do people refer to it in their discussions with um, on the ground in North Korea? Thanks, Hazel. We'll let you go first, and then if you want to keep on. Okay, I mean, clearly I'm not a policy maker, and uh, so to, an to answer the first question is I've thought for some time, and in fact I've given evidence at the Foreign Affairs Select Committee in the UK twice uh, on these lines, that um, there are DPRK embassies situated in, the, in European countries which are allies with the United States, for instance in London. Is, is this mic working? Is this working? Can you hear me? No, you can. I'm sorry about that. No, there are embassies, that's better, there are embassies... Um, uh, in Europe that North Korea has, in Western Europe, in, okay. in countries which are allies of the United States, for instance in London, and these are largely underused resources in terms of backtrack uh, uh, meetings or channels. There is 
lots of um, track one and a half, track two, whatever you want to call it, goes on directly between the United States and North Korea. Um, sometimes maybe the right people are not involved, but I think there are ways, and in fact they're, they're very well used, they're still used, that North Koreans, if you're asking about the modalities, how do you actually get talking, that North Koreans in the United States can engage in talks. They didn't used to be in Kim Il-sung's period, but there are, there are now. So I don't think that there is a mechanical ob um, uh, uh, obstacle. I is that the question? Sorry, uh, what would need to happen in order for these negotiations to start, also in light of what the ambassador said about the expectations of, of North Korea and also of, of the rest of the Well, I mean, the th these, are, these are political judgments, but I, I think these are not uh, questions of scholarly, although I, I can't say much more than what I said before. I think it, for, for the sorts of talks we're talking for the sorts of negotiations we're talking about, we're talking about pretty high level attention at both sides. To and and having an egg, uh, a strategy to to move towards. I mean, uh, these are all questions about how you get from A to B. You can, the channels are there, I, 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 and um, I, 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 at the risk, I don't want to repeat everything that I've said before. You know, I think having a special envoy, envoy, somebody like the status of Richard Lugar, for instance, on both sides of the aisle would help. You've got to have you've got to have a cross party agreement with at least getting going because that's been a problem in the past. And those sorts of things again. On the issue of the National Defence Commission, uh, the National Defence Commission became, since 1998, constitutionally, I can't, I can't see the person, I'm sorry, the, the, the executive authority within the country. So it doesn't mean to say that it looks at every single decision that takes place, and in fact the cabinet uh, in the country takes a lot of the economic decisions, but it means it has overall strategic uh, power both in domestic policy and in foreign policy. Yes, I would totally agree on the National Defense Commission. I mean, you have people, Vice Chairman, uh, you know, Jang Sung Tech and uh, Oh Gung Yol and some very, very senior people there, the uh, Minister of Defense, uh, Kim Yok Suk. Uh, you also asked about the General Political Department, which is very key for the Korean People's Army. I mean, that is the premier element of the KPA, basically overseeing the Korean People's Army and, 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 and Kim Chung. Uh, Kim Jong Un made a you know early decision in, in in assigning a new head of the general political department, uh, uh, Che Yung Hae, and that uh, comes out of the party, Socialist uh, Youth League in the past, and as a party man now, working with the KPA. So some very powerful things. I think the NDC, and I agree with Dr. Smith, is a very powerful organization. I think they weigh in on almost all decisions, and I think uh, certainly Kim Jong Il looked to the National Defense Commission. He established it. And I believe Kim Jong Un is, is probably doing the, the same thing, and the same thing on negotiations on the end of the Korean War. And so, but there has to be a process for doing this. People have to come together and sit at the table. And certainly, the ROK is very much involved in this. China is involved in this, as is the United States. So, got two people back in the corner of the table over here. Thank you, Mr. Hathaway. Um, my name is Bing Ru with Hong Kong Phoenix TV. Uh, my question is to Ambassador Durrani. Um, there's a breaking news just came out. U.S. officials says inter intelligence shows it's likely North Korea completed preparations f to test fire ballistic missiles. Um, if North Korea is going to start a new um, missile launch today, what is appropriate response should be? Are we expecting um, military action? Um, secondly, you're talking about China's influence on North Korea. With this new North Korea leader, um, do you think China's leverage on North Korea is diminishing? Thank you. I would just pass the microphone to your right. Thank you so much for your uh, thoughtful as well as uh, succinct insights on North Korea. Uh, I'm Jay Park with Radio Free Asia. My question is for both of you, Dr. Smith and Ambassador Ditrani. Uh, what do you believe uh, in Kim Jong-un's mind right now with the reaching of those tensions on the Korean Peninsula. And do you believe he, uh, US, is U.S. and South Korea is ready to give him uh, those answers and to address these issues? Thanks. Why don't we let you take a stab at sure. several of these first. All right, yeah, well, let me just say on the, uh, the missiles, I, I certainly, uh, I, I'm just as knowledgeable as you. I read what you read in the press. 
All indications are North Korea is prepared to launch. Uh, we don't know the type of missile. These could be SCUDs. These could be uh, en enhanced SCUDs that would get up to, you know, 1,000 plus kilometers. Or they could be nodongs with greater range that could, that could take us, uh, you know, significantly over 2,000 kilometers. So we're talking about that's something that could reach Japan, fly over Japan, even maybe to Guam. So it depends on the type, type of missiles launched and, and, and what have you. But also a lot depends on North Korea, a declaratory policy. Uh, making it very clear to the international community and uh, what, what, where they are and hopefully bringing monitors in to observe it. They'd be in violation of Security Council resolutions and, and, and what have you. But uh, I, if I were in Pyongyang now, I'd be advising Kim Jong-un to be as transparent as possible because these missile launches are, are, extremely, are extremely threatening, very threatening. I don't think anyone could just sit tight on that. So I have no idea. I'm sure the policy community and the respective capitals are talking about it, but I think North Korea has to understand this is a significant escalation on their part to have these launches. These are very, very especially if we're not talking, uh, you know, any launch, but especially if these are, are of a medium, medium range capability. Uh, these are, so I, uh, I would assume uh, this is a heated, being heatedly discussed, and I, and I would only hope that the DPRK would be prudent in how they address this issue, knowing it is a very, uh, it's a very, uh, uh, escalatory phase uh, in this in this period of relations uh, with the uh, outside world, and the only point I'll make on the China, I do chi I believe China has the leverage they've always had, with the fuel and the food, uh, with the new government in there. I think uh, the same leverage. Uh, that doesn't mean North Korea is going to march to China's tune. That's not what we're saying. We understand that North Korea is a sovereign state, and they 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 they're very proud of their independence, but the fact is they do rely on China not only for security assurances, but also for economic assistance and to keep them going and what have you. And, and it's understandable that they owe something to China in that regard because their actions affect China's security interests as it affects the region's security interests. This is the, they're not immune to that. So if they go nuclear, if they, if they launch missiles and so forth, if other countries acquire nuclear weapons capabilities, there's a proliferation aspect, it affects other countries and by definition it affects China's security interests. So it's all interrelated. Hazel, you've already addressed both uh, ch Chinese thinking a bit and, all, and even more directly North Koreans thinking. Do you have anything you want to add at this point? Um, on the missile uh, or the ballistic, more accurately probably the ballistic technology issue because that applies to both the satellites and the missile test, um, I think there are, political there are political implications and there are technical implications of tests. We know that, that they have had successful tests of short-range missiles. But it would, on the technical side, if uh, uh, and they haven't been very successful on the medium to long-range missile testing. So if these missile tests do show more success on medium to long-term tests, that means that they've made technical improvements in their programs, which is worrying. But the political issues are probably more important and what this indicates to me, if these tests go, are going ahead, simply reinforces the fact that we don't have any diplomatic framework in which, which any th of this is being discussed. I'm not talking about what the reasons are for that. I'm simply saying that if you haven't got a diplomatic framework whereby the political issues can be discussed, then these sorts of things are going to happen, and therefore we are in the position where escalation can take place because of all the other sorts of reasons. China, I think, changed its... After 2006, after the first nuclear test, um, it's extremely worried about what's going on in North Korea. It doesn't take it as a trivial issue. But it's, I think its strategy overall has been that it will, it's the major trading partner with North Korea. It's over 75% of its tr imports and exports go through China. Uh, and that it's, it's had a long-term vision. I mean, it has a long-term vision on everything. Uh, that over time, ch North Korea would become economically and socially uh, more implicated with, uh, with Chinese society and Chinese ways of doing things. And that may be true, but the risk for that, of course, is that when you have a crisis like now, uh, that that long-term strategy has difficulties in dealing with that apart from, you know, if, if, it's, uh, if it, for instance, cuts off oil, which it's done in the past. And it, if you do that, then you run the risk of, of further escalation. So the Chinese strategy has a problem in that it has a, a medium to long-term strategy, but I, I think it's not so clear what it can do in the short term.
back in the very back. I can't even see who you are. I'm sorry the lights are right in my way. I'm a Christine at Driver Congress. Um, how much do we know at this point? Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, the North Korean capability of the nuclear weapons, how they obtain the, um, the capability, because there is uh, some revisionist historian talking about the uh, Japanese physicist was there in the North Korean area during the World War II toward the end of it, and they might got the uh, you know idea from then uh, and so on. So thank you. Is that Junya? Uh, I am Junya Nishino at the Wilson Center. Uh, I have uh, two questions. First one is going to uh, Dr. Smith. Uh, you touched upon the social change in North Korea. Actually, there was a uh, limited but uh, many changes in North Korean society. So, you know, uh, because of the North-South exchange during Kim Dae-jun and Nam Hyun period and uh, uh, Chinese assistance to North, Cor to North Korea uh, past five years and also North Korea uh, implemented uh, economic reform in 2002 and the currency reform in 2009. So given these facts, uh, to what extent have these changes affected North Korea's leadership and the uh, power elite uh, structure in terms of uh, relationship between state and uh, society. And second one is uh, uh, going to Ambassador Detrani. So you mentioned the going back to the joint statement in 2005 is needed. So I agree, but uh, uh, it seems me that uh, there, uh, so we need a sort of uh, new or additional six-party agreement because uh, North Korea continued to uh, develop, develop nuclear uh, program and conducted uh, nuclear tests three times. Uh, so what do you think of uh, this uh, new or additional agreement of six-party talks and uh, uh, who will who should take the lead in dealing with North Korea at this moment? So the United States, China, or South Korea? And what is the role of the US uh, for reopening the dialogue with North Korea, given the fact that North Korea always wants a direct negotiation with the United States? Thank you. Hazel, let's start with you. And I'm going to. Um request that you actually take a little bit more time than you otherwise you would about talking about the relationship okay. between state and society, because you've done such great work on that. Um, thank you, Bob. Um, uh, briefly on the issue of the, on the nuclear issue, though, the, issue, the thing about nuclear development, whether it's nuclear development for peaceful purposes or for weapons, is there are different stages in the cycle, and there are different... Uh, uh, different uh, skills and resources that are needed for different stages in the cycle of nuclear development. The North Koreans have a very, very developed scientific sector. They've had tertiary education. The very, very many of their students go, uh, adults go into tertiary education. And the science of, of building a, 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 a nuclear bomb is, is not, relatively speaking, that difficult. So the Soviet Union, in fact, was helping them with a trial reactor way back uh, for peaceful purposes. So uh, you know, the diffusion of ideas on nuclear technology can come from Japan, can come from the Soviet Union, they can come from Western Europe, they can come from Eastern Europe, they can come from everywhere. I mean, science, science spreads these ideas through journals, etc. And so the North Koreans uh, have got the training and the, and the scientific skill to, to develop a nuclear program, have, have had for some time. The question is the technology, which includes the materials uh, and the engineering capacity. Now, the engineering capacity, and I alluded to this earlier, doesn't exist in a systematic manner in North Korea. And that's the, one of the major problems that probably is less addressed when we're talking about the North Korean nuclear threat. Uh, so I just want to put that to one side. So almost, I think, you know, you could, uh, you could argue, it, and in fact, it's the same when we're talking about uh, diffusion of New, of a proliferation between North Korea and other countries. You don't need to be able to have ships and airplanes. You can send a scientist on a on a plane, you know, B British Airways or something, to, uh, to, to 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 talk. So it's a complicated. It's it's not just a question of you know building nuclear reactors and and sending them abroad. It's a, it's a complicated process. Uh, on the issue of social change in, in North Korea, yes, there has been enormous not 
political change, but enormous social change in North Korea from the early 1990s because of the process of marketization from below. In the wake of the famine of the early 1990s, the population was about 23 million, up to best estimates about 600,000 died. Um, so the, the question becomes, how did the rest survive? How did 22 million survive? Well, they, they, in, they created the market, bartered, swapped, sold. The North Korean state has never been able to supply food or anything else on a regular basis since the early 1990s, and it's apart from basic rations to the military and sometimes to key workers. So that the market has continued, and it's kept alive by um, local government officials, party officials, security levels at the local level, who themselves are completely implicated in, in marketi marketized dim dynamics. By this, I don't mean... Uh, you know, when I talk about marketization, I'm not saying that marketization, the first order sign of it is physical big markets everywhere. What I mean by marketization in North Korea is that price is determined by the relationship between supply and demand. And it's got nothing to do with what the state says. This is completely different from the command economy of the of the uh, of Kim Il-sung period. And also that trading takes place not just in the big markets, but it takes place in apartment blocks, in workplaces, on the street corners. Those of you that are familiar with Latin America, of, uh, I worked in Latin America a bit in the 1980s, and it's very familiar to me of the street corner trading that takes place, petty trading. So what that... Th that's what's kept the economy alive, and basically with the Chinese petty trade coming in as well since the 1990s. And there's been there's been consequences of this, is that because the North Korean has government hasn't, the state hasn't had the, the the money to pay its party officials, apart from the most privileged to some of the, some in Pyongyang, but not all in Pyongyang, but not the middle level and not the local level, the teachers and doctors and the professionals, is that everybody's had to get by by participating in the market. These 2002 reforms, as you know, were actually a way to try to control this rather than to, uh, to, 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 to say, right, philosophically, we're going to have liberal capitalism in North Korea, far from it. What that's meant socially is that also, because the, the, the government has, has had to prioritize its resources it, uh, and its political resources, it's focused on the youth and it's left alone women, children. These days, for instance, children are not as regimented as they used to be, partly because the women that used to teach them are now in the markets. But it has had an incredibly tough policy in relationship to young people. Before, they always focused on the youth organization, but they d there is much more of the coercive element in North Korea now on, on youth. They have to go into the military service, and or they have to go and even when they're at university, they have to go and they always had to do other things as well. But now the government is more and more relying on this uh, in lieu of technology and capital. So you've got this uneven development where you've got some sectors of the society that see a lot more civic freedom in the sense the government doesn't have the capacity to to monitor them all the time, and some members of the society, particularly young people, that are actually much more constrained in terms of social indicators. Uh, the society has uh, uh, has uh, reduced. Uh, the government has managed to reduce um, malnutrition levels on the wasting level, which is the sign of severe malnutrition, to well below the Asian national average. Uh, uh, average for Asia, it's something like five percent now. The latest nutrition, compared to I think sixteen, seventeen percent for Asia as a whole. The major problem in North Korea now is is chronic malnutrition, which is when children get enough to eat, but they don't get enough meat or vegetables, proteins and minerals, etc. So there has been a change, change, change around on the, on the nutrition issues. North Korean nu nutrition, maternal mortality, malnutrition statistics, maternal mortality, uh, child mortality, vaccination coverage, vaccination deaths through immunizational protect diseases that can be protected by immunization, like polio and measles. They've really, really reduced um, uh, over the over the 2000s, which means that the, which indicates politically yeah. that the state still got some political organisational skills left. Uh, uh, wha wha and um, so, so, so in comparison, North Korea, of course, is much, much poorer than any of the rest of Northeast Asia. But its 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 poverty statistics are pretty much the same as uh, as anywhere in Southeast Asia, and in fact, they're better than Indi India and Indonesia. Always a shock to uh, audiences, I think, but that's the, in terms of malnutrition, child mortality, etc. So there has been. We haven't got time to go into it. To, what does that mean for the leadership? It means, I think, for the the the, 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 the for the population, in the Kim Il Sung period, the leadership.